What is habituation and how does it impact us every day without us noticing it? Could it actually be dangerous? Stay tuned. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here, we make videos on all kinds of psychology related topics. So feel free to browse through our other videos to check things out and subscribe if you wanna stay up to date and help us grow our channel. In my previous video on learning, I talked about what psychologists mean when they use the term learning. If you're new to this term, you can pause this video and check that one out first. But most people are at least familiar with the idea of Pavlov's dogs. Does that ring any bells? Okay, so it wasn't actually a bell, it was a ticking metronome, tick, 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 but that's not what we're supposed to be talking about today, so moving on. Today, we're talking about a really basic form of learning called habituation. Habituation fits into a category of learning called non-associative learning, because it doesn't require an association between two stimuli, like a sound and food. Instead, non-associative learning involves learning about stimuli that are repeated, Okay, so take a moment to take in all of the sensory information around you. You can probably see the screen and the color of my shirt, or lack thereof. You can hear my voice, but what else can you hear? What else can you see? What can you smell? What object is nearest you? Can you hear the sound of an air conditioner or a refrigerator? Can you feel the feeling of the clothes against your skin? Take a moment to notice all the features of the room. Are there pictures on the wall, signs on the door? How much time and attention were you paying to these things before I started talking about them? If you're like most people, not much. Taking in too much sensory information can actually lead to overload and can cause significant distress, such as the case for many people with sensory sensitivities, like in autism. It's adaptive for your brain to build filters that filter out the information that you don't need to process. If you come home one day and there's a kazoo on your desk, it might be useful to notice that it's there. Who put it there? What does it mean? Why are we here? But once you know it's there, it no longer makes sense to pay much attention to it. After all, you've got other things to focus on. That's where habituation comes in. Habituation is a form of learning where your behavior decreases in response to repeated presentations of a stimulus. This allows your brain to be efficient and not waste precious processing power dealing with stimuli that you already know about. It's important to notice a new stimulus that might signal a change in your environment. But once you already know that information, you don't want to spend a lot of time processing that stimulus. So you learn to ignore it your response to it goes down. Let's look at some examples. So let's say your neighbor puts out a new mailbox that looks like one of the yip yips from Sesame Street and it catches your attention right away when you go outside. After a few weeks you pass by it and when you leave the house you don't even notice that it's there anymore. When I was a kid we had a family friend who lived in a town with a paper mill. If you don't know paper mills are stinky like toilet funk stinky. Anytime we went there to visit, the whole time we were there, I couldn't get over the fact that it smelled like a toilet. But they walked around like nothing was wrong. They had habituated to it, such that they didn't even notice it anymore. My job places signs in the bathroom reminding people to wash their hands. But because we see them all the time and they aren't unexpected, we habituate to them. People don't even notice them anymore. The same could be said for signs like turn off the lights before you leave. In the laboratory, habituation can be studied by presenting a tone to a rat and startling it, called acoustic startle. If you keep presenting the tone, the rat will jump less and less each time. Or, classic studies on habituation have used the gill withdrawal reflex in the sea slug Aplesia. Now, it has a gill that sort of floats out in the water, and if you touch it, it will withdraw that gill into the body for safety. It will slowly, eventually, put the gill back out again and you can touch it again. Now, if you keep doing this over and over, it will keep the gill retracted for shorter and shorter intervals of time until eventually it will ignore the touch altogether. Now, for a DIY version of this, you probably don't have any sea slugs around, but you can go outside almost anywhere in the world, flip over a rock or a log, and grab some roly-polies. Gently touch them with a Q-tip or a paintbrush and time how long they roll into a ball. 
keep doing this and see if they get more and more used to you handling them. Now, if your neighbors get curious about what you're doing, just tell them, oh, I'm habituating the wood lice. If they still seem skeptical, just tell them, uh, don't worry, the doctor on the internet told me to do it. So habituation is what happens when the response to a stimulus gets weaker over repeated presentation of the stimulus due to learning. As you can imagine, this can be a double-edged sword. While it helps you direct your attention more efficiently, sometimes we want to capture your attention. Signs that remind you to drive safely are doomed to the habituation trap, meaning soon they won't be reminding anyone of anything. Here in Texas, where I live, they've solved this problem in a clever way by changing the stimuli. Every now and then, they change the electronic drive safe signs to have fun messages like, slow down, you're already in Texas, or the holiday themed, gobble gobble, go easy on the throttle. You see, when you change the stimulus or add a new stimulus and then the response comes back, that's a procedure called dishabituation. It's an important feature that allows the response to habituated stimuli to return when you need them. Here's how that might look in the lab. You've habituated the gill withdrawal response of your sea slug by repeatedly touching the mantle of the animal so that it no longer withdraws the gill. Now, you apply a very mild electric shock to its tail. Next time you touch the mantle, the gill withdraws and the behavior comes back. They keep it in there for a long time. This is a classic example of dishabituation. Remember, I defined habituation as a decreased response due to learning. There are a lot of reasons other than learning that a response might decrease. Maybe the individual is tired or fatigued. Maybe their sensory receptors have been active and need time to recover, which is something we call sensory adaptation, like when you brush your teeth with minty toothpaste and then drink your orange juice right after. Not a good thing. <laughs> it turns out that dishabituation is an important tool for showing that the reduction in behavior was due to learning, not these other things. If the response comes back during dishabituation, then it rules out a lot of those alternatives. It can't be fatigue that accounts for their behavior, for example, because they would still be tired when a new stimulus was presented. There's one other thing you should know about habituation, which is that it usually doesn't last forever. As long as the stimulus keeps repeating, it will. But if there's a long interval of time without the stimulus being presented, the next time it appears, the response might come back. So let's say you habituate a rat to stop responding to a tone on one day. The next day, if you start training them again, presenting the tone again, they may recover their startled jumping behavior. Since this recovery of behavior happens spontaneously without having to do anything but wait, we call this spontaneous recovery. Spontaneous recovery is a feature of habituation, but it pops up in other forms of learning too, when responding that has decreased comes back on its own after a while. Okay, so those are the basics of habituation. It's when a response to a stimulus decreases over repeated presentations due to learning. It can be a good thing for helping you focus attention, but it's something that will work against you if you want to maintain people's attention for long periods. In order to show that it's habituation, you have to rule out alternatives that don't involve learning, such as fatigue or sensory adaptation. Dishabituation is one way to do this, by presenting a new stimulus and seeing if the response returns. The other way to get the response back is by just waiting a while without presenting the stimulus and see if you get spontaneous recovery. You've probably habituated to the little subscribe icon in the corner down there and the like button found on this video. But if you found it helpful, clickety-click. Subscribe if you want to get other upcoming videos on habituation and other types of non-associative learning. And until next time, keep thinking. To whoever it is at the Texas Department of Transportation that comes up with the road signs, they don't pay you enough. Keep them coming.